just before COVID hit, I had a really um, strong meditation where spirit came through and said that um, pretty much shit was about to hit the fan and that some um, heavy things were going to go down and that we were going to see a split in the in the planet and a split among the people and that there were there was going to be a lot of darkness that had been there for a while that had been swept under the rug so to speak that was going to be released and coming out and there was going to be a huge divide um, between the light and the dark It is such a pleasure to have you on the podcast today. I've been really excited about this one because I've had the pleasure of speaking with Judea, your co-host from the Spirit Speakers podcast. And so I'm really excited to have you here to share your perspective and some of your experience as a psychic. So thank you for being here. Thank you, David. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Let's get started with you sharing a little bit of your background and how you discovered your gifts. Okay. Um, my father was extremely psychic. He wasn't a psychic, but he was very psychic. And so we grew up with that in our house, like the phone would ring and he would say who it was, or we'd all have like baseball games scheduled and he'd say, oh, that's going to cancel for, for this reason. Or, oh, I, I think so-and-so is going to show up. And then somebody would show up on our doorstep. It, it was that type of thing all the time. And so we were pretty used to it. And he had told me that um, he got too much too fast when he was young and shut a lot of it down. And I didn't really understand that until I got older and had my own children. And it got to a point where um, even though I had, had had a lot of psychic phenomenon happening, when I, I had my own children, I remember when, one day um, one of my children was supposed to go out onto the ocean for a field trip. And I was really nervous about it. And I was, you know, wondering, is this just a mother being nervous or is this a premonition that they're not supposed to go? And I realized that I needed help with that. I needed help controlling it and understanding it. So I started manifesting a teacher and I found a teacher and I worked with her for um, almost 14 years, um, kind of developing my skill. And I'm extremely empathic and sensitive. And that's kind of how I started out. I, um, I moved to Colorado and I was living in Colorado. My family was in California and I had a dream one night that my brother got jumped by uh, what I thought was a motorcycle gang because they were all wearing helmets. And I called my mom the next morning and I said, oh my gosh, I had the worst nightmare. And I told her about it. And she said, Patty, the day before my um, brother and his friend decided to drive their car over to the rival football team. This They were in high school and the coach had the football team attack attack them and jump them. And they actually rolled the car over with my brother and his friend in it. And they were all wearing helmets. And I'm like, oh, okay. And then another time I thought I was having an appendicitis attack and I went to the hospital and they said, yes, your symptoms sound, you know, typical of, a, of this. And I took blood tests and they said, no, it's not showing up. And they sent me home. And then my mom called later that night and my brother's appendix had burst. My other brother's appendix had burst um, at the same time that I had gone to the hospital. So I had that type of thing happening all the time. And I kind of was okay with that type of thing until I had my own children and I wanted clear answers. And that's when I uh, found a teacher and really did a lot of a lot of work on understanding it and um, being able to rely on it and know if it was my own fear or my own monkey mind or if it was coming in from the outside. And then um, I discovered that I had a gift at, for reading people. And um, so I moved into that. And then I've been doing psychic readings professionally for about mm, 18 years, I think, 17, 18 years. So going back to your childhood growing up, were you guys religious at all? Did you have a religion or were you just open to anything? You know, my, my dad was, he was raised Southern Baptist and I don't think they knew what to do with him. And he <laughs> would really take us to church, you know, and, and try or read the Bible to us, but it, it never really stuck. <laughs> you know, it never, we never really went very far. You know, we, he and I went to to church one one day um, to a, a church kind of close to our home and he went into the big church and I went into the, the children's church and they were um, talking about how it was our duty to save people because we don't want people to go to hell and if they don't know of Jesus they'll, they're going to go to hell and I kind of raised my head and my hand and said well you know if, if you're raised Buddhist there's a chance you're going to be Buddhist if you're raised atheist there's a chance you're going to be atheist and I think it really depends on what's in your heart and what type of a person you are. And they actually went and got my dad out of the big church and had him come get me, <laughs> take me home. <laughs> so 
And he was on my side with that one. So that was the last time we attempted to go to church. So he really believed in, in like the devil and, and God and Jesus. My mom was raised Catholic, but, um, she wasn't really practicing, but it wasn't, I wouldn't say it was a religious household and any religion that did come up. It was very, it was always open for discussion and something that we chatted about, not something as if it were written in stone. Oh, that's so good. That's so healthy. Okay. So yeah. I agree. <laughs> okay, you guys would play games and guess, you know, who would call and or who would be at the door and stuff. Was that like, did your dad take it seriously? Or was it more of like a game for him? And what did your mom think about that? So there were many of these kind of games. We call them as his circus tricks. But there were some pretty serious things too. Like um, his brother was a really avid hunter and had hunted um, most of his adult life. And he was going on a hunting trip. And my dad had a premonition that he was going to be killed. And he told my mom he was going to be shot in the head through the eye. And he begged his brother not to go. And because his family's very religious, he grew up very religious, they didn't believe him. And that happened. Somebody was walking in front of him with a gun and it went off and shot him through the eye. And he lived for a few days, but he ended up dying. And then also, um, we were kind of a lower middle class family. So we would do vacations like every two or three years. And we had a big vacation plan and it was a, a huge to do when we had these vacations where we would drive, you know, to the Midwest and visit all the relatives. And, you know, things would happen where my dad would wake up in the morning and say, Oh, we can't leave today. And my mom would say, okay, you know, there were never any questions asked. So she took it very seriously. Us as children, we saw more of the lighter, funner, you know, more fun side, but she saw some of the more serious things. So she um, definitely took it, took it seriously with him. Did your other siblings have gifts as well? Yeah, we, we all three have um, are pretty psychic in, in different ways. One of my brothers actually um, taught tarot classes at the Edgar Casey um, Institute for a while. And then my, my younger brother, he tends to see ghosts and pick up on energies that way. Um, so we, we all have it, but in, in different, it, it just manifested in different ways. How do you use your gifts today? How do you integrate them in your work today? Um, you said you do readings for people um, and you studied for 14 years. And so what does that look like? Well, I actually just retired from doing readings after doing readings for all this time. And I'm now concentrating more on teaching classes and doing spiritual mentorship and coaching retreats, speaking engagements. Um, I just got to the point where I would like to teach people to be able to get the answers themselves and to strengthen their own connection with spirit and to trust themselves and to have a connection with their guides so that they can get that themselves rather than having to seek out help or get it from somebody else. So um, that's kind of what I'm, I'm doing right now. This just happened like a month ago. I just made this decision. So things I'm kind of in a little bit of a transitional um, time, but um, as far as personally, I, I use it constantly. You know, I kind of joke around on the podcast that if somebody were, were kind of secretively filming me throughout the day, they would think I was a, a lunatic. Um, because I, I'll be like, wait, what was that? You know, or I'll be like, well, that was a glitch in time. And wait, who is that? You know, I talk to myself and I talk to spirits and I feel things happening all day long. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, it, you know, even when I'm not working, I'm living a very spiritual life. And, you know, I talk to nature and nature talks back to me and I talk to guys all day long and I read things with people. Um, you know, one of my, one of my sons, my children all have this gift too in different oh, ways. Oh, wow. Yeah, they, they, they do. But one of my sons, we were, um, and this sounds, this sounds ridiculous, but we were having dinner with my husband, my son and my husband and I. And a man walked in and my son and I both looked at each other and we're like, oh my gosh, that guy's a werewolf. And, and my husband starts laughing. We're like, no, no, seriously, look at him. You know, and he didn't look like a werewolf, we, but we both got that energy that he, and meaning a werewolf, you know, that's kind of jokingly, but that he had some mystical, you know, like midnight magical qualities about him. But we both said the same thing at the same time. That's so cool. So could you clear up between being psychic, what it means to be psychic and what it means to be a medium? And for you, like personally, would you consider yourself more psychic or more medium? Okay. So there are different opinions on this. People use different titles and different words for different things. Um, how I see it is that a psychic is someone that can read energy. And a medium is someone that has the gift or the ability to connect with or read energies from different realms. 
So a psychic, like I could do a psychic reading for you, a medium, I could, could connect with the dead. I could connect with gods, goddesses, deities, ETs. So beings um, on different different realms is the difference. That's the way I kind of see the difference. Um, some people kind of glump them, glump them together. And I'm, I'm kind of, I'd say I'm 50-50, you know. I'm not more one or the other. So I actually call myself a psychic medium a lot, you know, and then you can throw in the term intuitive. What's an intuitive? You know, it's kind of like an intuitive and a psychic medium, I think are the same. There's just a lot of different titles and different opinions of what those mean. Have you ever had like spirit come out of nowhere to nudge you to give a message to somebody? Yes. <laughs> so, so I, I have really strong ethics around sharing information I, I don't believe in just like running into somebody at the grocery store and saying, oh my God, your dead grandmother's standing behind you because who knows what their relationship was with their grandmother? Who knows if they're in a place where they're able or ready or willing to hear that or what their personal beliefs are? Um, you know, so I don't, I don't believe in that. However, I have been nudged a few times to share something with someone that didn't come to me for a reading. They've never been strangers. They've, they've always been somebody I at least was acquainted with or knew. And I kind of argue with spirit. No, no, no. And they're like, yes, yes, yes. I don't want to, you need to. And uh, sometimes I don't, you know, sometimes, and I feel bad about that. Like in, you know, the, the two instances I'm sharing about are people that have passed loved ones that wanted to send a message to them. And if I do, I make sure that spirit is saying yes, and that I'm somewhat comfortable with it. And then I ask the person, you know, I'm like, this seems strange, but I'm getting a message. Are you would you like to hear it and get their permission first? But I don't always follow it. You know, there are times when I just don't feel comfortable doing that. You know, even though I fully trust spirit, you know, I get a, I get a say in some of the things too. Yeah, that makes sense. You were just in Mexico with Judea. Did you have any downloads? Was there anything in particular that you would like to share with us about your trip? It was wild. We were out in the middle of the jungle and um, with scorpions and centipedes and huge spiders and snakes, a boa constrictor crossed across the path in front of us. So it was it was kind of trippy. Um, but we had the most amazing group of people. And, you know, a lot of us were laughing. You know, when you get a group of people together, there's always at least one annoying person in the group. <laughs> and we did not have one single annoying person. We were all really like-minded and supported one another. And it was a chakra retreat. So every day we addressed um, one of the, the chakras and worked up the chakra system. And we were um, privileged, Jude put on, this is, it was Jude's um, retreat. And so I want to give her kudos because she did such an amazing job. But we did two excursions where we went to the um, ruins of Tulum, and then we went to Chichen Itza where they have the, the pyramid. And um, it was amazing. So when we went to um, the ruins in Tulum, there were many buildings that were really beautiful. And um, I came across, you know, I had kind of a few people follow me. Are you feeling anything? Are you feeling anything? And I was just laughing. No. And then I came up to a building that was very unassuming, but I just was like, whoo, you know, my heart started to flutter and I really felt a rush from that. And so I, I sat down and meditated for a little while and I just kept getting the term um, processing the dead and the dead and processing the dead. And so somebody ran around and said, oh no, this is actually a control tower. And I'm like, well, that's strange. Um, and so as we walked around, there was a second sign that said it was an area where for religious um, ceremonies and rituals and magic rituals and um, human sacrifice. So Ooh. that made sense on what I was picking up on. And Jude and I weren't together. And then later on, I talked to her and she had um, a full channeling incorporation um, you know, and she was telling me where it happened. And I'm like, what did the building look like? And then her husband said, oh, I have a picture. We took the husband's this time. And he showed me the picture and my jaw just dropped because it was the exact same building that I had felt this at. And, you know, of all the buildings there, it was one of the least assuming, you know, it was missing a roof. It was kind of crumpled. And um, yeah, so we had the same experience. And then uh, when we went to Chichen Itza, we both walked in and we just were like, whoo pulled up to the top of the main pyramid, which I feel terrible. I can't think of the name of it off the top of my head. Um, and it, it fully felt like a portal to the ET world. There was a lot of uh, extraterrestrial energy and it just pulled you up. And as you got to the top, it just kind of opened up into this portal. And as we were standing there staring at it, one of the women said, look at the wind. And the wind was moving the clouds in opposite directions. So the clouds were coming around the top of it 
opposite directions from each other. And there were light beams hitting the top of it. And, you know, many, there were 32 of us, I think, and we all had photographs. And when we looked at the photographs later, um, there was always one cloud, regardless of the direction of where the sun was coming, that was fully lit up like a portal, you know, and it just felt like a portal to me. And it was, it was fabulous. And I took off from there and took a tour because I really wanted to learn a lot about the Mayans and more about how they lived and how they used this place. And Jude did a lot of meditating and kind of off by herself. So we had totally different experiences, but initially we both felt that portal and, and that energy. So, um, yeah, it was fascinating. You've talked about a council of beings that you work with. Could you flesh that out for us? What does that mean? And what is that experience like for you? Yeah. So the term galactic council gets thrown around a lot. And this was kind of prior to that. I, I would wake up knowing, I would just feel like I was working all night long. I still do. I, I sleep normally like 10 to 11 hours a night. And I think that I probably really only sleep a couple, which is why I'm in bed for so long. Um, I would be like trying to open a portal or trying to make some heavy decisions, all of these things all night long. And I would just be like, oh my gosh, you know, I do spiritual stuff for a living. Let me just have be a human and sleep at night. And then I started to have um, recollections of sitting on a council, like across the table from other be beings. And I knew it was extremely important work. And I knew that we separated into subcommittees but that's all I could remember. And every once in a while, I would get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and I'd be like, oh my gosh, I can't forget this. I can't forget this. And I'd wake up in the morning and be like, I can't remember. Like I would be able to retain little pieces of it that would be mind blowing. And then I'd go back to sleep and forget it. So I would meditate on it. And they made it very clear that I'm not meant to know all the details as of yet. And that I'm on a council making um, some serious decisions about the shift in the planet and I am one of the people that are, are there on behalf of the human race. And I realized that there were other beings that weren't human. I mean, I knew that much. And um, so I said, can I just remember something? Can you give me a little tidbit? And they let me see the, the being sitting across from me. And I know people are going to think this is so bizarre. Um, but I would describe it as an octopus being. Very bumpy skin, kind of a reddish orange color and um, many arms. Um, and so they, they let me retain that. And it's, it's very interesting because since then I have had three coaching clients that have, without telling them this, um, have had an ET that look like a, um, octopus type of person show up, or that's been with them since the one that's been with them since they were a child. That's like what their, their spirit guide looked like. Um, so that's interesting. I, I, you know, I, I really would like to sleep. Um, <laughs> so I've been trying to bargain <laughs> with them. Um, and I've been told that some, most of the big decisions have been made, that there, that a timeline is set, um, that there are a few small details that need to be taken care of and that I can't get off yet. Um, but, but that, um, it's starting to wind down and that, that things, and, and I did recently know that we were making a decision that had to be made that night. Like I remember being in a state of stress, like we have to come up with an agreement. You know, and not everybody was in agreement. I believe it, it's decisions on what's happening to the human race and what's happening in our planet and what the shift of the world where it's going. Um, because I truly believe that most of us that are here on the planet, at least those of us that are, you know, somewhat tapped in and connected, that we chose to come here to either witness this or or be helpful or um, be part of, of this transition. So I think, I don't think I'm the only one. I think there are a lot of us doing a lot of work on, on different levels um, towards this shift. It's like almost like they were programming you, getting you ready, upgrading you, whatever they were doing. Um, have you had any other downloads about what might be happening with this shift? Yeah, it, it's interesting because Jude and I have a lot of similar things and then some several things that are totally different. So my, mine started just before COVID hit. I had a really um, strong meditation where spirit came through and said that um, pretty much shit was about to hit the fan and that some um, heavy things were going to go down and that we were going to see a split in the, in the planet and a split among the people. And that there were, there was going to be a lot of darkness that had been there for a while, but had been swept under the rug, so to speak, that was going to be released and coming out. And there was going to be a huge divide um, between the light and the dark. 
and that that was necessary, that there were people on the planet that really needed to see this to be able to make changes, to be able to move into their heart chakra, to come from a place of light and love, that it was necessary and to not worry about it. So for me, every time some scary thing came up, I was able to be like, okay, this is necessary. It's okay. You know, we're leading, some, we're, we're going where we need to go. Um, and so that's how it started. And then um, we had, Jude and I had a guest on um, our show, Vinnie Tolman, um, who talked a lot about some of the things that he saw. And even though it was different than Jude and I, there were a few things that he said that validated some things for me. Like, for instance, I was told that there were a, a, a slight few of us on the planet, not us, I'm not one, of um, people that hold um, our master key holders, that they hold a key and that as the world starts to shift, um, they will, it's almost like a technological type of position where they will like unlock things or lock things back in and help it shift. And he validated um, that for me. And then I'd also, prior to him coming on, some of this stuff's really hard to wrap our human brains around. Um, you know, I was shown that the world was going to shift into two. There was going to be the 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 older world, the planet, um, you know, with all the pain and the hate and the wars. And then there was going to be this beautiful planet that was going to be run with love and brotherhood and sisterhood and caring about the environment and proper, uh, you know, technology, um, that actually had the environment, you know, in, in mind of, as they moved forward. And, and for me, I think Jude, Juicy is, is as like one on top of the other. I see it as two kind of separating. I don't know if that's metaphoric, if it's, you know, just us separating into two different realms. You know, I, I believe that we, are, you know, we are the drivers of our own bus and that we decide the type of experience we're going to have. And so I believe that there's going to be many different experiences happening here. And again, while June and I um, agree on a lot of things, I have been told by my guides pretty clearly that this is going to happen on many different timelines and that um, people are going to have different experiences because people are in different places. People have come here with different roles where, you know, Jude might be out there slaying demons and I might be like, come this way, bring a snack, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, you know, um, so I, I just keep getting that there's nothing to worry about and nothing to fear. And, but I do find myself thinking about it and looking forward. Like I'll have times when I'm just sitting outside thinking, oh my gosh, nature is so beautiful. I'm going to miss this. And I'm like, wait, where did that thought come from? Um, so for me, um, I, I've been wondering about this, wondering what my role is, what I need to prepare. And spirit came through and said um, in a really clear voice while I was driving my car, not even in meditation, why do you keep thinking about this thing that's going to happen? It's already happened. It's already happening. And they said you were predicting or you were shown a split um, between the light and the dark. And they said that's obviously happening. And you were shown that people would start um, communicating more telepathically and the light workers would be stepping up and people would be really opening spiritually. And they're like, that's happening all around you. You live a telepathic life. And I'm like, true. And then, you know, they're like, and then you saw that you would be living in somewhat of a nirvana, a beautiful place. And they're like, look where you live. You know, and I live with the ocean in my front yard pretty much. And the, well, like half my eye on down the road and the forest behind me. And I, I love where I live. It's my art project and my sanctuary and I just feel safe here and they're like it's already happening it's it's already shifting so there are those that believe it'll be like a light switch you know and um and maybe for some it will be um but I I see it a lot lighter than a lot of people do you know and maybe I'm doing that protecting my own fear who knows but that's that's the kind of the way I see it is that we can set intentions and we can decide what our role is and if we want to be down in the pits pulling people out or if we want to be up above reaching a hand out, you know? Yeah. I, I feel that. I hear you. I had Vinny on my podcast as well. Yes, that's how we heard about him. We yeah. stole him. From <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you did too, because you have a huge audience. I'm so, so glad that you guys got him on your podcast and that you did the follow-up Q&A with him because that episode oh. was mind blowing. So I highly recommend that episode to everybody. Go watch the Vinnie Tolman uh original episode and then the QA that they had because it was incredible. Um I've been on this whole kick with ETs lately. 
I'm wondering if you're getting any downloads or do you think that they're going to be a part of this shift that's happening? I mean, I feel like they're here already, but are they going to make themselves known? If we're comparing Jude and I, Jude is the ET gal. You know, ETs, I've always believed in them. My dad always talked about them as if they were real and he had had experiences with them. So I don't know if that's part of it, that I don't have big ET experiences just because I see it as, well, yeah, sure, they're there, you know, just like your neighbor lives next door. Um, but I have seen ships. It's funny. Every ship I've ever seen has been in the middle of the day, in daylight. I have never seen any at night. Jude's pointed out a couple to me that I probably wouldn't have recognized on my own at night, but um, I have always seen them during the day. Um, my dad lived out into in the desert for a while. And, um, he saw ETs all the time. He said that one came down and he, what he said was Patty beware. Some of them are assholes is what he said. Um, <laughs> so and I'm like, Oh, okay. Um, I've always believed in them and I think they are here that there are some here and that some people can see them. Some people aren't able to see them, um, because of being on the council and some of the, the dream dreams that I can remember. Um, I believe that um, it's it, what happens here on the earth was not just up to humans, that it's like all beings from all planets in our galaxy that we were all deciding together um, how this was going to move forward and where we're going to go. And I believe that there are, are some ET races that maybe weren't, you know, cheering for us. Um, but there are many that were and that um, are, are coming to assist us and to help us already here have been coming but will come and and clearly make themselves known and be more open and i think the government knows that and that's why they're starting to release footage and more information is kind of preparing us and kind of letting us ease into it a little bit um so that's yeah that's that's what i think i i live on the coast in northern california and i have a friend here that has been sending me she's one of those et people there are et people that just see them all the time you know and and she's one of those and she's been sending me footage of seeing them over the ocean that is just a trip like you know and she's talking about it and talking with them and asking it can come closer and then this yellow orb will shoot and her entire car is full of bright light and then it shoots out and um you know and we get so many people sending us videos and things that it's hard not to believe it when so many different people are are sending us you know, video clips from their phone and telling us about experiences they've had in addition to people that I know. I've heard that the military has never seen them. I mean, word on the street that the military <laughs> has never seen them like actually go out into space. They always go into the ocean whenever they're following them, which is really interesting. So they're living here. There's got to be an underwater base or something. Yeah. And then uh, Skinwalker Ranch as well. Like there's, they're like living in the rock there somewhere. There's, there's got to be something in there. Well, yeah. And then you look at the Lemurians at Mount Shasta, living in in the mount, the mountain of Mount Shasta. So yeah, I'm, yeah. I've never been there. I've, I, and I'm, I'm in California. I'm in West Hollywood. Um, so like, I guess it's not that far. I mean, it's far from here, but yeah, you could camp at my house and go over to Shasta the next day. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> What's it yeah. like over there? It's um, it's magical. And besides just being beautiful, um, there's just such a unique energy there. And um, I went with Judea and two of our friends the first time I had gone, and I channeled the Lemurian. And we were laying in bed, and we didn't even really know much about Lemurians. And we were in um, a, a, a one one big giant room and in different beds. And this blue light comes into the room and just hovers in the middle of the room. We had all just turned off the lights to go to bed. And I said, does someone have their phone on? And they're like, no, what the hell? And it just shone in the middle of our room for a while. And then it zipped out. So the next day we started asking people about it and buying books about the Lemurians and found out that they were blue and that blue light comes through and um, and yeah, and then we all had downloads and it was, uh, it was amazing. We all, all four of us meditated on it and had our own experiences, um, with the Lemurians and shared that. And, uh, yeah. And, and now even my husband, who's a little more of a skeptic, he loves Shasta. He wants to go every year for his birthday. He wants to go to Shasta and he's a bike rider. So he rides his bike and I, I meditate and talk to the, the, the Lemurians, but, um, it's, it's extremely magical there. Extremely magical. You feel it immediately. Oh, I want that. So all of you saw the, the, the blue orb in the room. 
Yeah, we were in a yurt. So it was just one big giant yurt. And we had all the lights turned off and we were in the middle of the forest. There were no, there was no lights anywhere. We were out quite a ways. Um, and it just came and, and hovered in the middle of the room. And we well, all What did it look like? Was it like a bowling ball size, a tennis ball, like a golf ball? You know, it was so bright. It was like a light. So you know how with the light, it's hard to define edges because it mm -hmm. radiates out. But it was as far as radiating out, I would have said it was like a bas side of, of like a basketball, maybe by the time it radiated out, um, just bright blue. And it just hovered for a while. And then it whoop, zipped out. Did you feel anything in your body? Did you feel anything emotionally when you saw the light? When I first saw it, because we were out in the middle of nowhere, I was thinking, is somebody shining a flashlight in here? You know, because and, and that was, I was a little anxious about that. Like, you know, we're out in the middle of nowhere. Um, but then, it then you know, as we started talking to each other, it was obvious that it wasn't a flashlight, uh, you know, because the way it hovered and then how it disappeared. And, um, you know, we're, we're all pretty spiritual. And so we chalked it up to being something spiritual. And we were all a little nervous going to sleep. I didn't pick up any big giant vibes from it other than what the hell, you know, kind of thing. But yeah. then later on, we we meditated on it, then we all got pretty strong, you know, and we, we went again a second time, all of us together and got pretty strong uh, energy and, and felt it. Um, it's just a it's just a buzz. There's just a buzz there that's unlike any place else, a frequency that you can feel through your body. It's kind of hard to describe it. Um, but in the, and if you go up on the mountain, you really, you really feel it. Oh, I can imagine. It's pro another one that like Sedona, I've heard is great. Like I've not been there either. I don't know why I'm not going to these places. They're like super close, not super close, but drivable. Yeah. Sedona is so beautiful. And my husband and I went and I told him, I said, so I'm going to be meditating at the vortexes. So you're going to have to keep yourself busy. And he said, no problem. And we, you know, we hiked the first day um, on a beautiful hike and went to vortex and he actually meditated with me. And then we would go on hikes and, and I would say, do you feel that? And he's like, yeah, you could feel the energy start to shift as you got closer to the vortexes and then there would be a sign, but you, even, even him, you can feel the energy um, and the vibration. It's different. You, you sense it before, as you get closer, you can feel that you're getting closer to it. Cause I'd say, I think we're getting closer. He's like, yeah, what is that? And then we would come and there'd be the sign that we were at the vortex. Um, yeah. Totally magical. I've heard that from friends of mine who also are skeptics. They don't really talk about this stuff at all. They're not spiritual. And they're like, there's something going on there. They feel it as well. That's super cool. Yeah. It's super funny that you, that your husband is skeptical. Like, what does he think about what you do? Um, <laughs> you know, we, we have this wonderful marriage where we allow each other to be who we are. We don't try to get, you know, like, I don't think you need to be me. I don't need to be you. We can, you know, we learn from each other. We respect one another, even though it's different, but he is starting to shift a little bit. Um, like he believed that, you know, he used to, when we got together, that when you die, you're dead, that's it. And then, um, I had a ghost in my house. This was a few years ago. And from, from my, my back bedroom, there's a, what I call a sunroom. My house is almost, it's like a U shape and it's pretty much glass. And I had seen a, a ghost walking through the sunroom. First night I got up with a baseball bat because I was, it I knew it was probably a ghost, but it was a little bit more of a form shadow than I liked. Um, and so I said, uh, you know, you need to tell me who you are and why you're here. I'm going to give you a couple days. And if I, if you don't let me know that I'm going to banish you. And then my daughter, um, was laying in my bed. We were, we were just chatting and all of a sudden she goes, mom. And I'd seen it and I'm like, yeah, it's okay. She's like, is that a ghost? And I said, yes, but it's okay. You know? So she goes running out into the living room. Dad, 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 I saw a ghost. And he looks at me. He's like, yeah, I saw it too the other night. And Patty, you need to get rid of it. You know, so even though he doesn't believe in it, he has seen the ghost and he is getting a little bit more on board. He, um, he went with me to Mexico and Jude's husband, Jay went, we were a little worried <laughs> how that would go, but, um, he participated in everything. He did breath work and he said, Whoa, that was a trip. And, um, yeah, he was a champ. And one time I was trying to get the answer to something. He's like, well, why do you ask your dad? And I'm like, my dead dad, you think I should ask my dead father? You know, so I catch him every once in a while, kind of out of character. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. I love that. That's so cool. Patty, what is your most memorable, validating, and impactful experience you've had as a psychic? Okay, there are a lot. Um, my most impactful. Okay, I think it would be um, a connection I had with my grandmother after she passed. My grandmother was my person. 
And um, I had been down to LA, um, that's where I grew up, and visiting my mom. And I finally talked my mom into letting me have my grandmother's locket. And I brought it home in a little brown box. And I had been unpacking and everything. And I was watching something on TV and there was a locket on TV. I'm like, oh my gosh, where's that locket? And I went to get it. And before I'd left on, on my, my trip down to LA, I had found a little trinket that I was going to give to my friend's daughter. And I put it in a, I had it in a little brown box. I was going to give it to her. And I thought, oh, my friend doesn't want this crap in her house. And I threw it away. Well, I started to panic and I found the box. I opened it and it was the trinket. So I threw away the, I had thrown away the wrong box. And I was just like, oh, and I was trying to like, did I throw it away or did I think I should throw it away? And I was just panicking. So I just decided, okay, I'm just going to manifest, you know, my grandmother bringing this back to me. So I just would talk to her and I would say, please, if at all possible, could you help it return? Na, na, na. And I'd wake up in the morning and just be sick and be like, oh man. And I ask her again. And then um, I have my own closet and in my closet, there's a shelf about chin height. And that's where I will throw my jewelry and stuff at the last minute and hang it up later. Well, I had taken everything off of that shelf multiple times thinking it's in a tank top, it's in the corner and it wasn't there. And so um, I woke up one morning and I said, okay, I'm going to let this go. This will be the last time I ask if you can bring it to me and I'm going to let it go. But it would be really cool if you put it on that one shelf. And if it's there, I promise not to lose my shit. I'll keep it together. And so I got up. And I, I, and that it makes me emotional. I walked in there and it was sitting on the shelf in front of all the t-shirts and everything sitting on the shelf. And, and my husband doesn't go in my, my closet. We don't have kids at home anymore. And I started kind of laughing and crying a little bit hysterically. <laughs> and then I remember telling my grandmother, I wouldn't lose my shit. Um, you know, so I'm like, okay, just calm down, just calm down. And I opened the box and it was her locket and it was Valentine's day. And I didn't realize that until later on that, that day that it was also Valentine's day. So that was, that was stands out because that's, even though I talk to dead people a lot, I've had a lot of dead people. They became my teacher. When I stopped going to school, I'm um, going to my classes, dead people started telling me how things were and how this worked and what it's like here and blah, blah, blah. So even though I've had a lot of conversation with people that have passed, that's the first time that I was truly witnessed what they can do, you know, their, their abilities. And now when I lose something, I ask my grandmother and, and I'll say, grandma, can you just put it on the bed? And I'll go in and it'll be sitting on my bed, like all the time. It's hilarious. Is it hard for them to, to do that as a spirit? Cause I've heard so many stories like this. From what I've been told, there are, you know, it, it's not like we all have the same path and do the same thing. There are there are people that choose to, after they've died to watch over their family for who knows how long. Time is not a thing up there. There are people that work on behalf of the humans, like meet the humans as they cross over to help them or, um, you know, do more scientific things to help the environment. So there are, are people that cross over that do kind of working things. And then there are people that cross over that go deep into the one or that um, decide to let go of earth and are doing something different or getting ready to incarnate. So there's lots of different levels on the other side. And I believe that um, it's not easy. And when we want to talk to loved ones, they're a much higher frequency than we are if they've crossed all the way over. So we need to raise our frequency up and kind of meet them halfway. And so I believe that they have to lower their frequency quite a bit to come here to do things. And I believe there are some that are able to, some that are interested in it, and some that just aren't able to or aren't interested in it, or that's not important to them, or that's not really what their role is. For me, uh, re just the last couple of years, I feel like my grandmother's more distant. I feel like she's gone into the one a little bit more, but she was there for me. Um, she would show up sitting on the end of my bed and comfort me when I was having a hard time. So she had chose to be kind of closer to earth, at least for a while. But, you know, it's different for everybody. Oh, that's beautiful. That makes sense. I have a question about that. Um, like, let's say I would be devastated if I lost my parents and my sister, or people that are close to me. Um, but I know that if I go... If I pass and I go to the other side, it's going to be like, whoa, this is incredible. One, if we live many lives over and over and over again, and we're, you know, supposedly reunite with our loved ones, which set of loved ones do we reunite with, with if we've lived so many lives 
which, you know, do I, am I going to meet my parents from this life or another life on the other side? And do I forget this set of parents once I go to the other side and realize that I'm so much more than this body? And do like, do you detach emotionally from, from everything in this world? Does that make sense? It makes me kind of sad to think about because like, I love my parents so much. I don't want to forget them and I don't want them to forget me when they pass. And, but if they're going off onto an, you know, into another body somewhere else or another existence, you know, as we do, um, who's going to be waiting for me on the other side? I think it's hard for us to totally wrap our brain around it. We as humans like things to be linear and to make sense. And I think when we get messages about this from loved ones or, or downloads, it's being dumbed down quite a bit because it's so multifaceted and so multi-layered that it, it's hard for us to understand that. Um, so let me think of how the best way. So I, I believe that we are all one, but we kind of drip off. We kind of drip out of the bowl of soup and do our own little thing and then return. So there's a soul memory of every experience you've ever had. So in your soul, you never forget your parents or your sister or your loved ones. It's in that soul memory. And then also when, um, you know, like when my grandmother died, she's still with us. On that end, they know that we're all one and we're together. We're the ones that are missing it and seeing, thinking we're not going to ever see them. They already are in a state of wisdom and light and love and are watching over us. And, um, you know, I've never, you know, there, there are different degrees. There are spirits that don't cross over and that's a different story. But for those that have crossed over, they always come from a place of love and light. So even if they're apologizing for something that they did, it's, it's, it's less of feeling guilty or shame and more of out of love for you. They want you to know that they are sorry they put you through that, but it's always out of a state of love. So as far as incarnating, um, I believe that we incarnate in, in teams, like maybe, um, my husband and I have incarnated together a couple times because we're working on something together or they're, I owe him something or I want to pay him back or there's some karma that we decided to, to go through, but it tends to kind of move around. And I've read people where I'll be like, well, your, your, your wife was um, a neighbor, you know, you, you knew of each other, but you didn't really interact. And this is the first life where you're really interacting, but it disperses a lot. And I don't believe there's like a handbook or any rules or regulations for that. And the other thing is um, one of my good friends, her father passed. And for some reason, he and I, I didn't really, I mean, I, I had met him several times, but he and I weren't like buddies while we were alive. But once he passed, he came through really clearly for me. And he educated me on a lot of things. And he said that this life is like one nice long walk. To us, it feels like an eternity. But on the other side, it's such a short blip. So even though you're thinking that you're going to miss, you know, if you die before your parents and you're going to miss them, it's such a short time in the big scope of things that it's kind of like, oh, I miss them, you know, but it's like a day, you know, you don't see them for a day or something. It's, it's a totally different timeline and a different and a different energy. Um, and, you know, it's kind of like if we, in our own grieving process, if we had somebody that passed, you know, at the beginning, it's raw and hard and terrible. But over time, it gets to a point where we can think of them fondly. And when we think of them, instead of being heartbroken, we smile about, you know, the laughter we shared or these great experiences. Um, I think eventually it, it, now where was I going with that? It, it kind of gets to be um, like that on the other side. You, you love them, but you think of them fondly. And it's more like, oh, what an amazing experience. I feel so much gratitude that I got to be his mother or his friend or his sister. It's, it's a different, it's a different type of energy rather because it all comes from a state of love and light. So we don't have mm -hmm. grief, shame and guilt. You know, if my mom or my dad have been, you know, my boss or my brother in another life, like we're all, once we like, shed our bodies, we probably, the essence of all of that is completely different than the essence of what it's, what we are in this body. It's like the essence goes, mm -hmm. and the body stays. I'm guessing that's what it's like. Yeah. The essence you, of our soul. Still, yeah. And you still have a, a relationship with them just on different terms. And I have a lot of people that say, um, oh, it was my dad with my mom on the other side. And I like to say, he's not just with her, he is of her. They are back in that union of oneness. However, there is a little bit of a process where people 
past and they are um, more alone, they know that their loved ones are there. They've been, um, you know, greeted by them or that energy of them as they're processing and getting, you know, used to where they are. And then they'll go into like a soul review and then they'll join up. But for us, I think a lot of times, even the way I see things, I think it's dumbed down for me to be like, oh, your grandmother's there. Well, is it my grandmother? I thought she was oneness, but it's the grandmother, the part of your grandmother's soul that you had a relationship with. So they make themselves known as that to help comfort you or to help help you understand it because it's so complicated, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. What do you think happens when we die? Um, you know, it's so interesting. My grandmother said, you know, she, she came to me one night. She's like, do you want to come and I'll show you, I'll hold your hand and show you the process. And I'm like, are you allowed to do that? Did somebody tell you you could do that? You know, <laughs> and she's like, do you want you, when you're ready? And I, I haven't done it because like you, I'm afraid I'm going to go up there and love it so much and not come back. You know? And I don't want to miss my, <laughs> my children um, and my husband and my dogs. Um, so I, I, I haven't really done it, done it yet. I've gone a little ways and then chickened out and come and come back. So um, I believe that there are different experiences when we die. I have seen um, earthbound spirits, people, I've helped people cross that either had a difficult life or were worried or they were maybe raised religious where when they die, they are worried that they're not um, good enough to go into heaven, that they're going to go to hell or, or something's going to happen. So they don't allow themselves to cross over and they get in this place of stuck. I have also seen people that... Um, want to contact a family member that has passed and I see that they're not in a good place and spirit usually stops me and won't let me go in and tell them, but I'll just be like, you know, as gently as I can, they're not in a, in, in a good enough place for us to contact them. We, they need some time. And so they may have some darkness that they need to release or work through before they're able to go up into the light. Um, some people hover in a kind of like what the hell moment. Some people cross over instantly Animals cross over instantaneously. Um, so it's a different, it's not a one size fits all. It's a different experience for everybody. Most of the people that I've read, once they do let go, they cross over and they um, are, are met by a beautiful light or by loved ones. They feel welcome. Um, most of them say, oh my gosh, it, it's, this is so beautiful. And, and this is such a trip and you have no idea. And all of my, my religious views were wrong or my religious views were right, you know, or it's way more than I expected. So they cross over um, and then they go into a life review stage where they look back on their lives. And this is more of it is, is the amazing, beautiful impact they had on the world. And they're able to see from a place where they complimented the waiter and the waiter went home and was nicer to his child. And then his child complimented the teacher. And then the te you know, how just the smallest act of kindness that we can do, how it can blossom out like so, so far. And so I think, you know, in addition to seeing some of our mistakes and being able to um, kind of learn lessons or track our karma, understand the completion of what we came here for, what I get is most of it is the opposite is how beautiful the experience was and how you impacted so many people. And the, the tiny things that we do that we take for granted can have such a huge meaning. I'm a huge complimenter. I talk to everybody. It used to, when my kids were teenagers, it used to drive them nuts. Um, but now they're like that too. You know, I, I recognize them doing that as well. And I'm not going around lying, but you know, somebody might have a beautiful smile or they might have a pretty shirt on and why not tell somebody? So I'm, I'm, I'm a really strong believer in that. So they go through a life review. Um, there's no such thing as time. You know, somebody be like, my grandmother's been a life review for 10 years. I'm like, I don't know, maybe that's really a glitch. Or I mean, maybe that's two seconds in that time. I don't know. So they're in a little bit of a life review stage when they're done. They um, travel on to either if they're going to work some specific thing or take care of something there, or if they're going to go into the oneness, back into the soup bowl, into the yummy, or if they're going to go like when people are getting ready to incarnate, it's almost like they're at bat, you know, they're in the batter circle getting ready to, to move up to bat. So um, there's lots of things that happen, but I, I kind of see that as long as it goes smoothly, you cross over, you go into a life review, and then you decide from there um, where you're going to be. 
Yeah, I've heard about that life review from some of the people I've talked to. And, you know, there's no judgment. It's just them judging themselves, you know, and you know, on the other side, if they mistreated someone, they, they feel that mm -hmm. how, you know, they're, how they treated the person, they feel it from their perspective. I'm like you, like I compliment everybody. I talk to everybody. Um, I just like to, I like to be a, you know, a mirror and a reflection uh, for people to see their own divinity, you know, like it feels good to make people feel good. Yeah, exactly. And if, if we all felt good at the same minute, wham, you know, <laughs> the, the, or the world would shift. Yeah. In, I also in, instantly. Yeah. I also sing in grocery stores and I can't tell you how many times I've been in an aisle singing because it's usually really fun sixties music that they play in the grocery store here. And then someone on this aisle will join in and then someone on this aisle and we have a little concert going, um, you know, and it's just beautiful, you know, that's just connecting and that's oneness. And, um, yeah, I love that kind of stuff. Have you ever had an entity attached to you from working with somebody who had it attached to them? Um, so I, I am not an entity demon slayer gal. So when I work, I set very strong into, I'm the sunshine psychic. I set really strong intentions that I work with this upper scale. I, I'm not interested in pulling entities off of people or fighting with demons or gargoyles, or that's not who I am. I send them to Jude or I send them to somebody else, or I just ask that they find their way to somebody that can help them and that not be me. However, I have seen people where I'll be like, oh, like, like somebody squeezing the back of your neck. And I'll be like, oh, it's your dad that's passed. But when he was here, you know, we need to let that go that this there's, you know, we need to clear that energy or a wedge in your throat that was left from somebody criticizing you growing up or traumas can show up as entities. And I have had clients where I've had entities on them and I have used light or sound and, and helped move it or soften it so that they can kind of do the work or I send them to somebody that, um, that specializes in that. Um, I have, I mean, I've, I've had my dark moments of the soul and I don't feel that I've had an entity jump on me from anybody, but because I'm, I consider myself an extreme empath, I will carry or, or hold on to someone's pain or someone's trauma. It's more for me rather than seeing it as an entity. I need to clear and process and then clear out any energy that I've picked up from my client because I'll read a client and be like, Oh, do you have a headache? And they'll be, yeah. I'm like, okay, it's her headache. And then I let that go. Or mm -hmm. I'll just this heavy sadness. And I'll say, you just carry this heavy sadness. And they're like, I know, what is that? You know? And then we try to figure out what that is. Um, so I, tr I believe in entities um, and attachments and I have seen them. Um, but I am a little bit of a control freak um, when it comes to spirituality. And I have very strong boundaries on what, my business was going to look like and what I personally was willing or able or interested in doing. Good answer. Yeah. I know everyone's different. Um, my last guest, Jules, she's a healer as well. And she told me a story how she had an entity literally jump from somebody onto her and attached to her heart. And she had like bruising all around her heart and, you know, it was like down for a couple of days. Um, yeah. So for those, I've, yeah, I've, go helped ahead. Other, I've helped other healers clear entities that they've gotten from clients and seen bruising and things from people too. And then, you know, our friend Judea certainly has many stories um, of that happening. Are there any tools that you can offer people on how to protect your auric field to keep that from happening? A lot of us are sensitive or, you know, empathic and we go out in crowds, we interact with people on a day-to-day -day basis. Are there some tools that we could use? Any techniques Sure. So our aura is a, the electrical magnetic field that radiates off of us. You know, they have cameras now that they can film that. Um, it radiates anywhere from an inch out as far. They, they used to say three to four feet. Now they're saying it goes out as far as 10 feet and it wow. radiates out of all direction. And this is why if somebody sneaks up on you, you sense somebody is there or if somebody's too close to you and they're too much in your personal space, we tend to interact energetically as our energy fields cross one another way before we watch someone's body language or, or take in what they look like. So we are energetically connecting. Um, our aura, I, I can't tell you how many people I read that have a beautiful aura that's like two inches wide. Now what happens is, especially if we are empaths, we some people can see that if I'm nice and big and bright, I could be light to the bugs. You know, I'm trying to hide or protect myself or wear a little bit of a cloak of invisibility because I'm so sensitive 
So I am, I shrink, you know, my aura shrinks with me. And this is another thing when we're sick, we roll up in a ball and our aura shrinks when actually we should be doing the opposite. We should be mm-hmm. running in the light, rinking our ear, our aura nice and big so we can be running healing energy. So our aura is our protection. Um, if we have, if we turn up our inner dimmer switch and let it be bigger and brighter and radiate out, when something comes in, you can imagine that if something hits the outside of your aura and it's four feet away, you're going to sense that ripple of energy and be like, oh, hell no. Or, oh yeah, what's this? If you have it three inches from you and something comes in, it puts you in a a state of fight or flight or anxiety or being stunned and not knowing how to react. Um, So when um, I, I don't, it's not a one size fits all all the time for protection either. Um, I keep trying to keep my aura nice and big and bright. Um, and, And that's my protection for empathy. If I'm going to a concert where I'm going to be around a lot of people, I'm making that bigger, brighter, and almost gelatinous or or more dense. So I have a little bit more of a protection. There are people in my life where the minute I see their name on the phone, I put like a bulletproof glass <laughs> in front of me where I can react with them and see them, but that I have a lot of protection um, from them. So, you know, there are people, you know... We can go to a party and we're all drawn to the person that has that bright light around them. They not may not be the most interesting person, but there's something magnetic about them. And it's this bright, beautiful light where there's somebody on the couch that's way more interesting, but you can tell they don't want to talk to you and their auras and so we're not interacting. So this is kind of the feel of it. If you're an extremely sensitive and empathic person, to be big and bright almost seems counterintuitive to what you want. So this is something we have to get used to. The bigger and brighter we are, the more protected we are, but we do have to get used to that's going to like attracts like if you're big and bright, you're going to attract big and bright things and wonderful things, but you're going to start attracting. So I like for people to, if you're a visual person, come up with a visual. If you're a sensory person, something sensory or to experience or imagine whatever you need, some type of protection that feels good to you. A lot of people, when I was in school, were using like those jars that they put, bell jars or whatever that they put over like antique clocks. I'm super claustrophobic. I'm like, no, no way am I putting a jar over around me. So I work with that egg. Some people like to do a web of light. Um, you know, some people like to um, imagine that there's like a, a waterfall of water around them. You, you know, you can use all kinds of things and you have to play a little bit and find one that works for you. Now, not all empaths have a tight chakra. I mean, a tight aura. Um, like for instance, I know somebody that's very insecure and when they walk in the room, whoosh, you get pushed to the wall. Their light and their aura is so huge, but they're overcompensating for their insecurities or their social anxiety. So it works in a lot of different ways. But um, I would work, I would start by working with your aura. We're front oriented people. So we tend to have our aura tends to be bigger and brighter in the front and we forget about the back. You want it to be all the way around. And I really like the inner dimmer switch. And so it's like, okay, I'm going to turn my inner dimmer switch up 5% today and see what happens. And you'll know that at the end of the day, you're like, oh, I actually like got complimented, you know, several times today. And I found a you know $10 bill on the road and I was headed out late, but I got to work on time because if we're running light, then we are attracting light. Um, But it it takes a little bit of of getting used to. And you can also make like your outer layer a little more dense of your of your aura. Um, Yeah, you just have to play with it. What do you do? Oftentimes, I'll just imagine like a beam of light coming from source down into my crown chakra and then radiating out outward. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Especially in the middle of the night, too, when I have to go to the bathroom and like I'm freaked out by the dark. Like I just imagine my light growing. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. 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 I, that's how I clear. If I feel like there's a little bit of dense energy around me or I've just been around somebody negative or heavy, that's how I clear. I imagine that light coming in and then it's just getting so bright that it's it's taking out with it, moving out anything dark and then just kind of like, poof, you know, sending everything away. So I, I do that for clearing, too. Yeah, that's great. Cool. Thank you for that. Oh, I really, really, I'm so like happy that we got to talk. Uh, do you have any final messages for the audience? 
you know, I'll just kind of plug my biz a little bit here. Um, my business is Wing and Ether. Ether is spelled A E T H E R. And I'm um, either pdavispsychic.com or wingandether.com. Um, and uh, you can go on there if you're interested in any classes. I'm doing a one on one coaching. I have an empathy workshop coming up. Um, a psychic reading workshop. So if you're a psychic reader and you want to practice reading, and then also um, I'm going to have a course coming up for those that are light workers professionally that just need some support with difficult clients, keep making sure that you don't pick up on entities, clearing your energy, that type of thing. And then um, I'm also a witch. I'm in the middle of Witch School 101, teaching Witch School, and Witch School 102 is coming out in the fall. So those are the things that I'm doing right now. And if you're interested, if you want to get on my mailing list, I don't send out newsletters or anything. I only let people know when um, something new opens up, a class or a course. That's great. Awesome. And I'll leave all your information in the description. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. It was so lovely meeting you. Um, you know, you are such a great guy. You have such wizardly energy about you. Um, <laughs> I feel like you have an inner wizard. It was super fun um, talking to you, David. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I will be listening to Spirit Speakers. So I, it's so funny because like I listen to you guys, you know, you, you, you've put out a lot of episodes and I've pretty much kept up with every single episode over the last, you know, how many years have you guys been doing it now? How many years Four. has it been? Four? Yeah I, even, yeah, I didn't even plug Spirit Speakers podcast. Um, we just passed four and we're almost um, just shy of a million downloads through Apple Podcasts, which wow. blows our mind. We were not expecting this. This was just kind of a little fun thing we were doing together. So it's been quite, quite a trip. Amazing. Well, congrats on all your success and we will talk soon. Okay. Thank you so much. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications so you never miss an upload. Your support means the world to me and I will see you in the next video.